living off the land, growing your own food for the family and to sell, sustaining yourself through your own hard work and sweat. It's satisfying, but it sure can be eerie. The nights are extra dark away from the city, and there's a lot of different animals lurking about. Those that do live off the land know very well what kind of horrors exist out there, and that's why they keep a 12-gauge close to them as they watch the night, rocking quietly on the porch. Enjoy these terrifying, allegedly true stories about farms. If you have a scary experience or encounter, share it with us at darkstories.org and be sure to like this video if you want to be scared. Now, let's begin. It nearly took my life from Ramon P. I was 16 years old. I was in Kentucky. I'd gone over with my parents to visit my grandparents' place, who owned and lived on their very own farm. We had planned to stay a week there or so, just catching up on things and doing family-related things. My grandparents' farmhouse was fairly big, having two floors. My parents slept upstairs in a room near mine. The rooms were not as big as I imagined, but they were fairly comfortable and decently sized. Around the second day of our stay at my grandparents' farmhouse, me and my parents would normally get up early in the morning to help around the farm. My job at the time was basically just feeding the sheep, horses, cows, chickens, pigs, etc. However, when I got to the chicken coop, I noticed that there were some chickens missing. In fact, there should have been 16 chickens when I counted, but there were only 14. Basically, there were two chickens missing, and I could have sworn that the day before I counted all 16 of them. I made sure to close up the chicken coop good, too, before going to sleep for the night. And now, two were gone, and I might be blamed for it. There was no way they could have simply escaped. It was pretty much impossible for them to get out of their coop with all the doors and windows completely shut and locked up. I walked around the coop just to double-check that there was no way for them to get out, whether it be through a crack in the wall or a hole in the ground. When I walked around the coop to the backside, I immediately noticed that there was a big hole near the bottom of the back wall, probably about the size of a normal-sized beach ball, except this hole was not round. It was more of a jagged circle. I swear that hole was not there the night before. I checked all around the coop before leaving as I usually did. I went and looked for my grandpa and led him back to the coop where the hole was. When he saw it, he appeared to have this worrisome look on his face, like he knew what had made that hole. He shrugged and told me that it must have been a wild bear or wolf, but I don't think a wolf of any kind could have made a hole like that, not through a solid wooden wall, and there certainly were no bears around here. After my grandpa left to go check on the pigs, I closely examined the hole, kneeling down to get a closer look. When I knelt down on my knees, I noticed a very unusual footprint. How did I miss that before? The footprint was similar to a cat's paw print, only that this print was noticeably bigger than a normal cat's. The paw print was slightly wider than both of my feet together. I noticed that there was a faint line of the same prints headed down into the nearby backwoods. I kid you not, these footprints were very spread apart from each other. Whatever made it must have been quite big. Then again, maybe they simply just jumped. At that time, my curious mind just wanted to know where they led, or what they led to. So I followed the trail of footprints, which ended up leading me to a very thick brush. However, they stopped right in front of the thick brush, so I began searching for more possible footprints. Whatever it was could not have just flown away or simply disappeared. Nevertheless, I found another trail of footprints about 12 feet in the back of the brush. These prints seemed to lead further and deeper into the woods. Of course, my curious mind kept telling me to follow those prints. I had to know where they go so I did. 
I only wish I had stopped at that very moment and ran back as far away as possible from there. I followed the footprints to the very end. They led me to this hole near the side of a big stone wall that was about 10 or 11 feet up from the ground where I was standing. This hole in the wall was about 17 feet wide and 8 feet tall. At this point, I simply couldn't turn back. I began to approach the crevice of the stone wall. It was pitch black inside, not letting me see anything beyond 6 feet of the entrance. Before I could walk inside of this thing, I was suddenly and unexpectedly paralyzed with absolute fear. I began to notice that the woods had gone silent around me, as if the animals hidden from eyesight felt the exact same dread. All I could hear then was my heart beating. I had the urge to simply run back, to escape to the safety of the farm but I felt like I was being watched, and that the second that I would run back, the moment I twitched, whatever was watching me would without a doubt pursue me and get me. Now, becoming very aware of my surroundings, I was able to see a faint object within the cave. When I focused my attention to it, it became clear. Two chickens, the ones that had been missing this morning. There were feathers all over the place and traces of dark fluid. Obviously, these chickens were no longer alive and certainly were no longer one piece. It was then when something else caught my attention. Within the corner of my right eye, I saw something hiding behind a thick bush. I froze and locked eyes with it. It looked like a hound of some kind with bright orange eyes reflecting the light from the entrance of the cave. It had no fur, but it had a mouth full of sharp and elongated teeth. This thing was standing on four of its legs, yet it seemed to be as tall as me, and I am five foot eight. This dog was unusually big and muscular, and dark as the night. I was surprised I could make out any of it in that cave. It took a small step forward, another one and then another one, before it let out this horrifying howl, making my hair completely stand up. Then, it lowered itself before lunging towards me, covering the distance between us in a mere second or two. It seemed to happen in slow motion, this realization that I was going to die and that it was going to be a painful, possibly slow death. But by some miraculous timing, a loud thunderous crack echoed through the cave. The last thing I remember is seeing that thing fall in front of me as it quickly picked itself up and ran away whining. Soon, it was out of sight, but I don't remember much after that. My grandpa says he saw me in that cave, as he had followed the tracks as well when he saw that I was gone. Just before I was attacked, he shot the thing. But I didn't exactly faint. He says I just unblinkingly sat there and that he had to carry me back home. I was in shock. I mean, I thought that was the end for me. Of course I was in shock. After all of that, I do remember waking up on the couch the next morning to the sounds of my parents packing up and discussing with my grandparents. Soon after that, we were on our way back home. I don't know why, but that day I remained completely silent, disoriented. But thankfully, the day after that, I felt fine. I was myself again. I was then able to ask my parents about the previous night. However, whenever I did ask them, they stayed quiet or would quickly change the subject. It's been two years since the experience. Nevertheless, I continue to have the same nightmare of that thing from time to time. I don't know much about the creature, but I'm just going to call it the Kentucky Hellhound. There were times when I would ask myself, what if my grandpa hadn't shown up when he did? What would that thing have done to me? What would it have felt like? 
I just hope I'm never in that kind of situation ever again. The Ghost in the White Dress from Country 1989 This story comes from a fellow trucker. My friend, Mr. Bow, we'll call him. We ate at a truck stop together, and he shared with me this story. Bow hauled dry freight, and he would pass through Gettysburg almost on a weekly basis. On one occasion, he stopped at an old grain silo farm, a farm supply depot. In his own words, he said the place was a mile and a half away from one of the many Civil War battle locations. Anyway, he parked there, a couple of dozen times in fact, but he strongly stated that he would never stay there again, and he would always avoid the road it was on if he could. Because last time he stayed there, he said he saw her. Her, I asked. And so his story began. It was no different than a normal night, he said. He was working on his logbook when something caught his eye. He said that it was almost 300 yards out, just below the tree line. It appeared to be a woman wearing white. She was standing there, one hand on her stomach and the other near her side. At first, he didn't pay much attention to her. It could have been anyone for any reason. He looked back at his logbook and continued to work. After a few moments, he glanced back up to see that the woman was now gone. He scanned the tree line for a moment, but he didn't see anything. And just before glancing back down, he turned his head forward, facing the front of the truck, and he nearly screamed. She was standing just in front of the headlights. And that's when he got a good look at her face and the fact that her eyes were gone. The eyelids were open, revealing fleshy, empty sockets. Her skin was so pale, like she had long been dead, but her hair was a tar, greasy black. Then suddenly, like smoke in the wind, she just faded away. At first, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what he'd just seen. But he chalked it up to being way underrested. He drove up the road a bit, thinking that it was far enough away from anything that he may have seen, but convinced himself that it was still just some sort of hallucination. He went to sleep in the back of his truck. At around 2.45 a.m., he began waking up because the truck was freezing. Like a deep freeze, it should not have been that cold in there. Not to mention it was August and was quite hot outside. It was 85 degrees out before he'd gone to bed. He could see his breath, so he rolled over to the other side, and that's when he saw her. Her head was sticking up past the floor of the sleeper, and she was staring at him. Her hands were on her chin, like a kid watching a TV show. But once she saw him looking... She dropped her head through the floor of the truck. He leaned up in an instant, looking around the cab. He saw her walk a few feet from the window just outside, but once more, she faded from existence. That confirmed to him that he was not hallucinating, so he jumped into the driver's seat and drove to a motel. He's pretty sure that he saw a ghost. It freaked him out quite a bit, and I know I saw him get goosebumps when he spoke of this, but I'll be taking his advice, and I won't be pulling over or resting by any Gettysburg farms. Phantom Cars of Tropical Queensland from Anonymous There are technically two stories here. I live in the far north of Queensland, Australia, where the tropical rainforest meets the Great Barrier Reef. A family friend of mine owns a lychee farm that I work at during the season, usually at the end of the year between November and January. It's good, but hard work, exhausting both body and mind. The long days are hot and the nights are very cold, and the bunkhouse for the workers is far from cozy. 
but I do look forward to it every year. The farm is about two hours from the city I live in. To get there, you have to travel the Kuranda Range, a winding and narrow road up a rainforest-covered hillside. Once on the tablelands, it's just seemingly endless roads through farmland and bushland. There are several small towns along the way, but for the most part, it's a whole lot of nothing, and several of the roads are notorious for accidents. Because of the nature of the drive there, we typically live on the farm for the whole season, the only days off being Christmas Day and New Year's Day, if the season is still going then. Last season, however, a friend of the farm owner died, suddenly, and we got an extra day off so he could attend the funeral. As mean as it might seem, I was happy for the extra day of rest. Having driven home and enjoying the luxuries of civilization and a good night's sleep, it was time for me to return to the farm in order to start work the following morning. I had tried to make the most of the day off, but I drive a small hatchback. I had to be at the farm before it got too late. In addition to the roads being isolated and treacherous, wallabies and other wildlife come out during the twilight hours and have few qualms with playing in traffic. A high-speed collision with even a small wallaby would probably ride off my car. Because of this, I had intended to be back at the farm before sunset, but that was not meant to be. To reach the tablelands from the city, you have to drive up the winding Kuranda Range, which on a clear run still takes 20 minutes. On my run, I got stuck behind a big semi-truck with no way to overtake it. Having cleared the range and on the open road, I seemed to meet with every caravan, trailer, and bus. As such, before I reached the township of Mariba, the last town before the farm, the sun had set. I made the decision to keep going. The farm wasn't much longer from Mariba, and the roads are fairly empty past the town even during the day. There isn't much out there. A few spread out farms, a low security prison, but mostly it's just bushland. I would just put on my high beams, I thought, keeping an eye out for any wildlife that might decide to cross the road. Off I went, flooring it on the empty roads. It was a pitch black night. The only things visible were what was illuminated by my headlights. Occasionally, I'd see lights from the farmhouses through their paddocks or orchards, but other than that, it was just me and the darkness. That was until I got onto a straight stretch of road, flanked by an irrigation channel on one side and a mango farm on the other. Down the road, I saw the orange blinking of a car's hazard lights. I eased off the accelerator, a conundrum passing through my mind. I'd heard tales of people getting robbed along roads, roads just like these, by people pretending to be in distress. This could be a trap, I thought. Then again, if it was someone genuinely in need of help, it was unlikely anyone else would be along this road for a long time. My conscience got the better of me, so I slowed down and stopped on the road next to the car. It was an old-looking sedan with the hood up, under which stood an older bearded man who was scouring the inner workings for something. He had white hair, a flannel shirt, and was probably in his early 60s, he didn't look up as I stopped. I casually approached him, and I asked him if he needed a hand. Still, he would not look up. He just stroked his beard for a moment, before replying, Well, if you could give us a jump start, we should be able to get her home. Despite having jumper cables in my car, I didn't entirely trust him. I checked the time quickly, in case I would need details for a police report. It was 7.15 p.m. Still, he could be genuinely in need of help. I couldn't just drive away knowing I could have done something. No worries, mate. I've got cables in the back. Let me just get off the road and get them out. I pulled up about 10 meters ahead of his car, still skeptical of the situation. As I got out, I clutched my keys and headed to the back. The man was still in the same position looking under the hood of his car. Not wanting to turn my back on him for too long, I merely cracked the boot door so the light came on, and I peered in through the rear window, only to see my jumper cables weren't there. I'm sorry, 
I think I forgot my jumper cables, I told him. I turned back to face the man only to find to my surprise, I was talking to myself. A little stumped, I simply got back in my car and resumed my journey to the farm. I looked in the mirror at the red glow of my taillights, and there was nothing behind it. It wasn't until I began thinking about it did I realize that what had just happened wasn't right. People and cars parked on the side of the road don't just disappear. Where did he go? I'd only turned my back for a matter of moments. I never did hear him close the hood or open his door to turn off his hazard lights. The road was essentially blocked on either side, and I hadn't heard the ignition if he had moved the car and drove away. The more I thought about it, the less I could explain, and by the time I got to the farm, I was shaking nervously. I was unable to comprehend what I had experienced. Luckily, I got some whiskey in my system to help me sleep, and soon the busy farm life made me forget about it. That is, until the next incident, just after Christmas along the same stretch of road. Part 2 I'd basically made the same bad decisions as last time, finding myself once again driving back to the farm in the dark. Just before the straight I was on last time, there's a dip in the road. That is, the road comes around a corner, goes down a hill, then up the other side before going on, the whole section being a few hundred meters long. As I was approaching the dip, I could see headlights behind me, and they were gaining on me fast. The headlights basically chased me down the hill, and by the time I reached the top, they're right on my tail. A lot of people speed along these roads, sure so I assumed it was someone too impatient to obey the speed limit on such an isolated road. A few seconds later, I'm on the same stretch of road as before, though at the time I didn't realize it. I pulled over as far as I can in my lane and stick my arm out the window to wave at the guy, signaling that I was letting him overtake me. It's not an overtaking lane or anything, but it's long and straight, and I did not want this guy literally riding me all the way to the farm. He seemed to get the message, and I watched in my mirrors as the headlights moved to the side and sped up. Suddenly, a gust of wind violently rocked my car. I swerved and frantically wrestled with the steering wheel, not wanting to careen off the road into either the irrigation channel or the rows of trees on the other side of the road. I regained control, gasping frantically, my heart pounding like it was trying to break out of my ribcage. I quickly scanned my mirrors and looked over my shoulders to see where the other car had gone, thinking maybe I hit it. But it was nowhere to be seen. It was at this point I realized I was on that same haunted stretch of road as last time, and I began to panic. I quickly glanced at the dash to check my speed and for any warning lights, but my eyes drifted across to the clock. My heart froze and my throat clenched, the panic being replaced with my stomach sinking like a rock. It was 7.15 p.m., the exact same minute as the previous experience. I made it to the farm and worked through the rest of the season without further incident, besides the typical farm oddities that everyone experiences. Strange dreams, figures in your periphery, rustling in the paddock at night, etc. I did some research and found there had been several fatal crashes on that very stretch of road. I'm not entirely convinced what I experienced was paranormal, but I'm at a loss to explain them, not to mention they both happened at the very same time on different days. Maybe it's just a coincidence, a very... Big coincidence. The Stick Figure from Dummy OP When I was about 13 or 14, me and a friend of mine were playing out in a field by my house. I live on the countryside, so I'm used to playing in the fields. We were walking around just exploring 
and there was an old farmhouse in the field. My friend, who we'll call Bill and I, went exploring in that old house. The place was falling apart, decaying. After going through it, we headed to the basement. As soon as we had gotten to the house, I felt like something was watching me, but Bill said we should still go into the basement as there might be something cool or interesting down there. He went in first, and I followed behind him. As we got to the bottom, it smelled like rust and mold. We walked around for a bit, but as we were about to leave, something fell from behind us. Bill and I both jumped, and we laughed when we saw that it was just a board. Officially being a bit creeped out, we began to walk back up the stairs to exit the old farmhouse. But as we made it to the top of the steps, I saw something out of the corner of my eye, just at the bottom. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me, so I just looked away. But then Bill said, Did you see that? I said, What? He replied, That, that person at the bottom of the steps. At that moment, a chill went through my body, so I hadn't just been seeing things and we weren't alone anymore. We both looked back down the steps, and we saw it standing there. It wasn't a person like we thought it was. It was more of a stick figure come to life, a way too thin, way too tall being that was only vaguely human-shaped. It appeared like a child's bad rendition of a person brought to life. I swear I could see it breathing, though. The two of us ran. We ran for 15 minutes straight. We stopped, nearly collapsing. We were back in the fields. When I looked up, I saw that figure again. And it seemed to be moving towards us, in what I could only call a run. But a stick figure running, it doesn't look natural at all. I was able to see that the figure was about 8 feet tall. But that's all I wanted to see before we began running again making it back to the house and locking ourselves inside. We watched out the windows for hours, spotting that figure moving within the tree line from time to time. It's been a year since the event, and nothing else has happened, but it's by far the most bizarre and creepy experience I had. You can grow your corn all you want, but you ain't gonna drag me away from my Overwatch match that I'm losing. Because out there in the darkness of the fields, the shadows come alive, and the land reminds you it is very haunted, and you should know just how deadly it is. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a scary experience or encounter of your own, and you want to tell the world, Share it with us at darkstories.org, where hundreds of fear-loving users are ready to read it. Plus, it's the first step to having me narrate your tale. If you want to support the show, check the links below. There's a link to my Patreon where you can donate to help me continue to produce content. There's also a link to my merch store, where you can get some horror-related merchandise, as well as a shirt with my slogan. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode about six real hotel horror stories. Hestia Art says, exactly what I needed. I've been sick and stressed and just feeling down. I'm always happy when one of your videos pops up. Thank you. You're so welcome, Hestia. As I always say, if something makes you happy and you're in a time of need, surround yourself only with what makes you happy. And if that's my creepy stories, then I'm more than happy to help. Feel better soon. Heather J says, Don't go to the no tell motel. Always feels like someone's watching you. Been waiting for your next upload. I'm trying to push out more content as soon as I can. It takes a lot longer than folks think. I wish I could make it easier. Maybe I could get some ideas if I stay at this no tell motel. But then all those ideas I wouldn't be able to tell you about, I guess. I don't know how the rules work. Ryder Walton says, can you do clown stories, or like a top 5 subscriber stories of the week? Hey writer, I have covered clown stories in the past, but I might do them again in the future. 
maybe if they become relevant again, or if I get a lot of stories for them. As for top 5 subscriber stories, I would love to do that, but maybe monthly. Plus, it's really hard to avoid narrating a good story, so I'd probably end up reposting those stories as a top 5. Anyway, thanks for the suggestions. Wade Winston Wilson Deadpool says, That intro was very Supernatural-esque. If only we could be more like Sam and Dean. Hey, if I could look as good as those two, I'd have it made. And Rachel Raider says, Very first Darkness episode to be played in my new car. Well, I'm happy to be what christened your radio. Enjoy your new car. Congratulations. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't worry, more scary stories are on the way soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're awesome people. Remember everyone, stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one.